Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 165, Writing Thrillers and Spy Novels, an interview with James R. Hannibal, coming to you on Thursday, November 14th, 2019. Well, I am much healthier than I was last week, but there is still a limited number of words that I can say in between coughs, so I am going to make the announcements quick. First of all, last week, and I do this all the time, I said James Marsden is the actor who narrates the audiobooks of the Dresden Files. That is not true. His name is James Marsters, and I like both of these actors, and I get their names confused all the time. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but anyway, James Marsters is the unbelievably awesome narrator of the Dresden Files audiobooks, if you want to go check those out. Also, um, just wanted to let you know a little bit more. I'll probably try to tell you every time I have any new information. We are definitely doing a writer's conference in Malmö, Sweden in August 2020. Yay! Everyone is invited. I hope that you can come from wherever you are, make it part of your vacation. We're going to have a little bit of tourism type stuff involved, Um, maybe some tours of things as part of your conference fee. It is probably going to be a Friday, Saturday and either the first or second weekend of August. It kind of depends on a few of the speakers' uh, schedules. And um, I've got one speaker confirmed. I'm talking to other speakers. Um, Also, I'm talking to publishers and agents to see if they would like to send someone over. So mark your calendar. It's going to be lovely, lovely, lovely in the summer in Sweden. Um, Not too hot, not too cold. And um, I think it'll be a really, really great time, really fun and lots of informative, inspirational information for you to um, take your writing career a little bit further, a little bit further all the time, right? Okay, so that is all I can do without coughing, those two announcements. And um, you're going to love this interview. It's very fun. James is actually so interesting uh, to talk to like all of my guests, that it was really hard to stop. But he and I talked afterwards about some other things that he can uh, come back and talk to us about. So uh, we are going to have a plotting, um, not workshop exactly, but a podcast episode that's all about plotting probably in March when his next book comes out. So without further ado, here's James. Today's guest is James R. Hannibal. James is no stranger to secrets and adventure. A former stealth pilot from Houston, Texas, he has been shot at, locked up with surface-to-air missiles, and chased down a winding German road by an armed terrorist. He is a two-time Silver Falchion Award winner for his Section 13 Mysteries for Kids and a Thriller Award nominee for his Nick Barron Covert Ops series for adults. James is a rare multi-sense synesthete, meaning all of his senses intersect. He sees and feels sounds and smells and hears flashes of light. If you tell, if if he tells you the chocolate cake you offered smells blue and sticky, take it as a compliment. Welcome, James. Thank you for having me. It's fun to be here. I'm so glad you're here. And you have the most interesting bio. (laughs) Well, I try. Start the chocolate. (laughs) I I don't know which part's the most interesting part: the the chocolate cake part or the the part where you obviously know that of which you write. Chocolate cake is always fun. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. And you know what? We have to just talk about this for a minute because I've never heard of this. I mean, I've probably heard about it like as an aside on something else, but I've never seen the word. And then I looked it up and I was like, oh, okay, this is really interesting. So um, how does having um, the intersection of all your senses in your regular life affect you as a writer, do you think? Um, I. I, that's a good question because, you know, it's my only experience. So I don't know how to experience the world another way. Um, but I feel like it fuels creativity. Obviously, um, it's, I employed synesthesia as um, a hypersense or uh, <clears throat> a hyper observant thing for my uh, young adult detective, Jack Buckles, in the Section 13 series. Um, we never say the word synesthesia in the books, but he has synesthesia, we call it being a tracker. And that worked out very well um, as a, you know, as a series. Um, but it, you know, as a, just as a writer, I think the way that I experience the world affects my writing. It, it creates color in, in a way that I've actually been edited down. My editors have, have you know, put notes on there. I, I, 
You said this smells red. We don't know what you mean. Um, you, need to, you need to change this or explain it. And I'm like, oh yeah, nobody else sees that as red. So I'll just delete that. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Now my mind is kind of going through and imagining like all the different things that might come out in my writing if, if I had that same sort of sense of seeing the world. Cool. Well, listen, um, I love talking to writers and um, my guess is that's why the podcast listeners are here. They love talking to writers um, and you can pretty much assume that most of our audience are writers. So let's start at the beginning. Um, you have a really interesting bio that I sort of want you to start there and tell us how did things move into you becoming a published author? Okay, so actually, let's start, let's rewind uh, many, many years, many moons uh, to my childhood. So I always wanted to be a writer. I attempted to write my first book at the age of four. Um, it was wildly plagiarized. I think it was a book about pandas playing soccer, and there was a book from the library about raccoons playing soccer. But, you know, I always wanted to be that writer. My first uh, short story was read over the radio in a small town in Missouri when I was 12. Wow. Um, and so, but then at 17, I joined the military and, you know, that kind of takes over your life. And, and I think in a good way, as far as experience for a writer, I always tell, you know, the English major that's about to graduate and they say, oh, I want to get my book published. I'm like, just keep writing, but go experience the world, go gain some experience that will inform your writing and then come back and, and write what's going to be your bestseller or, or whatever. Um, so I went into the Air Force, I went through the Air Force Academy out in Colorado Springs, studied, started in applied physics. Um, right. Unfortunately, that program was canceled <laughs> um, and they switched everybody to quantum and I didn't like quantum physics. Uh, and so I got a tap on the shoulder from this black ops former Navy SEAL who said, hey, we're starting a counterterrorism program. You want to you want to join up with that? Um, and that has really um, sort of steered my career. So I, I graduated with a degree in Middle Eastern Studies and Counterterrorism. I went in to fly the A-10. 9-11 um, happened. I wrote an intelligence briefing that I did not get credit for outside of uh, a small circle of people, but went all the way to the White House. Um, and then that, the, that small circle of people pulled me into the stealth bomber. And then in the stealth bomber, I wound up working on some things that most stealth bomber pilots don't know exist. Uh, and so <laughs> all of those things kind of started when the U.S. Air Force Academy canceled the applied physics program and I bailed and went over to the counterterrorism stuff. Oh, my gosh. What a story. Now, just out of curiosity, what did you imagine probably would have been the outcome if the applied physics program had continued? Um, so for the, for the science fiction writers in the group, um, if you remember Dune and the weirding way and the weirding modules, um, I was a huge Frank Herbert fan. And so when I joined applied physics, I wanted to work in acoustics and I was looking at all the different, you know, acoustic weaponry things, uh, uh non, um, uh, non lethals and lethals. And, but the air force, really, really was focused on quantum at that time. And so they, they killed the program, uh, which was a real shame. Wow. Okay. Well, I just have to ask you this. So I'm a huge um, superhero nerd and I write superhero books for women. So uh, I, I was putting a puzzle together yesterday and watching the Edward Norton, uh, The Incredible Hulk, as okay. opposed to the, the first Incredible Hulk, which my husband likes to pretend doesn't exist because he didn't like it. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, is that acoustic weapon that they use on the Incredible Hulk something that could theoretically be a weapon or is? I, sure, I think so. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know if it is, but um, yeah. uh, acoustics have been used to, to great effect in the past. We haven't focused on it, really. Um, so I would love to have the time to, to really dive into to that sort of thing. Maybe I'll make it a topic of a book and then I can you know, have an excuse to research it. Yeah, <laughs> good idea. I have a book on my bookshelf. Well, it's not, I have a new bookshelf because I, I have still boxes of books that haven't been unpacked because I had no place left to, to unpack. I'm still unpacking from moving to Sweden, but um, I have one called The Physics of Superheroes and it's big and thick and small print. And I can't wait to just be able to sit down and spend a couple hours just going, oh, wow. Okay. What could really happen that we see in comic books and comic book movies? 
So if I could nerd out or geek out for just a second, acoustics actually could change uh, our lives because we're, we're working, we, we as, in, as in the world, are working on acoustic batteries. So uh, you, we have in development and working prototypes that are, that are a little bit crude of batteries that are charged by sound. So the sound waves that are hitting the battery is creating the kinetic motion that's charging, charging the battery. And so it's, it's possible um, there's a lot of other battery technologies that are competing, but it's possible that we could have our whole lives powered by sound in a sort of almost perpetual motion kind of kind of energy. Everything that we put out in sound waves is then coming back and powering our lives. So I'm sorry, I, that's that's me on the acoustics. <laughs> okay. No, that is so cool. I'm thinking, wow, women can finally rule the world because we spend more words a day than men do. That's right. My wife's phone would always be charged <laughs> That's right. when she's talking to her best friend. Yes. We say that Starbucks, char Starbucks charges us up with the caffeine, but it would actually still be charging up everything else with all the people in there talking. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be so cool. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, all of this does after it does relate to writing, but let's get back a little bit. So you'd always wanted to be a writer. You ended up in the military and then doing pretty cool things. Some of which probably a lot of which you can't talk too much about. I'm guessing. Correct. Yes. And, and then, so when did you get back into writing again or start like putting more time and, and, um, I don't know, seriousness into it. So I was, I was deployed to Guam in, in 2006 um, and uh, I can't talk much about what I was doing there, but there was a, a significant amount of downtime. <clears throat> and so I, I really got back into, I had this idea uh, for Wraith, which was my first story. And I really got back into studying writing, the idea of writing, and then, and then putting thoughts down. And, and fortunately, um, I had uh, some family members and friends with experience in the writing community that were able to steer me uh, into writing a, a, a better better book than I would have with, I mean, you know, hey, I'm stealth pilot. I know everything about this. I'm God's gift to military fiction. Um, yeah. and, and there's really so much to the craft of writing that I did not know. Um, and so uh, I had some local people that helped me. And then as I moved forward, steered me towards the right books I needed to read. And then as I left the military um, and uh, really my first thriller fest uh, and people like David Morell, uh, Creative Rambo, and Stephen James, uh, Steve Barry, all these people gave of their time to make me a better writer. That's awesome. Yeah, I love those writers' conferences. I haven't been to Thriller Fest. I really want to go. But um, I was uh, down the street in the uh, RWA conference. Um, I think that it was the week before Thriller, Thriller Fest that year when they were both in New York. And there's just so much energy. And like you said, so many people who just, they, they just want to be there because they want to talk to other writers about writing and help us all to be better writers. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I built some really lasting friendships uh, out of these conferences. Um, uh, David Morell in particular uh, has been wonderful. And, and for him to, he asks about my cadets. Um, he passed on some information for me to, uh, to like last night, I was, uh, what day is it? Wednesday, Monday night, I was teaching um, risk management at my, with my civil air patrol cadets. And I was able to say, okay, Rambo's daddy uh, wanted you to know about doing a personal risk assessment every time you fly, because he's also a pilot. But, um, so, you know, really cool stuff that comes out of those writing relationships. That's very awesome. That's very fun. Okay, so people who are listening, even though we're just having a little chatty conversation, some of the points to consider are networking is good. Even if you are an introvert, there are so many cool people that you can meet that will affect your writing and your writing life. And you have no idea where those relationships will go. So, Absolutely. And let me tell you, um, my first Thriller Fest, um, Wraith had been picked up by a small publisher. And uh, so and it was Thriller Fest accredited. So they brought me in as a debut author. I was terrified and, you know, I'm a military <clears throat> operator of sorts and have been in, in danger before, but going to Thriller Fest with all these people, uh, it was my first writer's conference. I was terrified and I was introverted. You know, my job in the past has been to not be seen. <laughs> and so it was weird to be seen. Um, and so I was hiding in the corner 
and I saw um, a woman carrying uh, these big, heavy book boxes upstairs from the one level to the ballroom where they were setting up uh, a, a, a book event anyway. And so I rushed over. I, I, I didn't go over out of the goodness of my heart to help somebody carry boxes. I went over to have something into my hands so I looked like I belonged there and something to do. But right. that woman happened to be a mega bestseller, Steve Barry's wife. <laughs> and so she suddenly became my mom uh, <laughs> just because I had helped her carry a few boxes you know so little things like that you know it's amazing what happens at these events even for an introvert yeah oh my gosh that's so sweet and that's the thing is that my experience so far has been most people are super duper nice and my personality is that if somebody isn't being nice to me Either somebody's just given them some bad news or something, or somebody's just been not kind to them, or they're really nervous and their nerves come out as <laughs> seeming to be unkind or rude. <laughs> My experience has always been that people are great who go to writers conferences. Yeah, absolutely. And if you see me with the hostile resting face, as my wife calls it, that's, that's when I'm nervous or stressed or thinking about something. Yes. <laughs> nice. Well done. <laughs> okay. So, um, so your first book, small publisher. And then, um, so you were still working in the military at the time? Well, I was out for a short time, uh, strangely okay. enough. So I had just gotten out, um, but I had, I had to have connections with the base because the book had to be reviewed by security committee um, and, and had to be reviewed before. They didn't want me to give it, put it on a networked laptop. They didn't want it to touch the internet. Um, wow. Even uh, passively, they didn't want it to go to a publisher before they had a chance to look at it. Um, due to some of the programs I was involved in. And I had to hand carry it to the program security committee, which so far I haven't met anybody who's had to do that uh, in, in, in the military thriller genre, except for me, yeah. um, which was, you know, I think it was just more of a neurotic uh, uh, manager in the security office than anything else. But anyway, so, um, so I w went back and forth to the base, but I was out. Um, and then I wound up uh, in 2000, in late 2009, joining back up as a drone pilot. Uh, for a short time in the Air National Guard. And so then I, I, that's, that's how I kind of went, bounced out. So I was out while I was writing um, the last half of Wraith and Shadowcatcher. And then I was back in while I was writing Shadow Maker and okay. Lost Property Office and Fourth Ruby. So that was all, uh, was, you know, the kind of weird stuff when you go back from active duty to guard and reserve. Right, right. Awesome. Okay. So, um, so you've mentioned uh, a couple of the titles that you actually have a middle grade series as well. So tell us a little bit about um, your feelings, how you decided to write both middle grade and adult, how you balance the two voices, that sort of thing, whatever, whatever is your experience in there. So um, a lot of people ask me, you know, was it hard to go from writing you know, military thrillers to uh, young adult fiction? And for me, it really wasn't. Um, there is a difference in how you write them because when you're, particularly when you're writing from middle grade, they haven't fully developed their abstract thinking. And so you need to take that into account. Uh, however, as far as, you know, well, you know, how did you keep it clean for the middle grades? All my, all my writing is clean. I write, I don't, I don't, having been in those situations where when guys are using foul language on the net uh, or on the comms, wherever, um, everybody's thinking, what a clown you know, because it shows a lack of professionalism. So when I see it in the movies, and the guy who's just, you know, cussing up a storm on the net, I'm going, what a bunch of clowns. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I didn't see the need to put it into my military writing. Uh, and I already had actually several teen fans um, because parents had read these books and said, hey, this is clean. There's no sexual content. There's no foul language. Um, there is one guy getting stabbed in the eye, uh, but they still handed it to their kids. <laughs> and, and so... Um, I had been teaching a middle grade boys book club in our local area uh, for a nice. couple of years. And um, we were running out of content. We were running out of things to, for, for them to read. Um, and so my wife said, well, then you, you should be writing stuff for these people. And I had an idea for the Lost Property Office. I had been sitting on it for a couple of years because I felt that my job was to write military fiction because of my background. And I thought that's what my agent wanted. Um, and then I pitched, uh, my, after, at my wife's insistence, I pitched the Lost Property Office um, and it went at auction. It was optioned by Columbia Pictures. And so, you know, it was all, nice. all very uh, fun stuff. Yeah. 
Well, I'm also a huge fan, my husband and I both, of the Warehouse 13 series. It's semi-short-lived, but we watched every episode at least twice. And when I saw just the, the name of your first book, The Lost Pro Property Office, I was like, oh, maybe I'll read these middle grade books just for fun because there's no more Warehouse 13 for me to watch. There you go. Well, yeah, it does have that kind of uh, artifacts, you know, all the artifacts that, that you're searching for. So it has a, has a little bit of a Warehouse 13 feel. So I'm glad, I'm glad that connected. Nice. Okay, so let's see. Um, the, book, the book that we actually really want to talk about right now is The Griffin Heist because, yay, if you're, watching, if you're not watching on YouTube, we just saw the cover. Actually, why don't you hold it up again? It's a real nice cover. It is. It is beautiful. Ravel does an amazing job with the covers. Chasing the White Line is even better. Um, so I love that. Nice. Okay, so tell us a little bit about this. This is book one of a new series. And if I um, am reading everything on Amazon and your website correctly, this is the first time that you've had a female protagonist in your books. Is that right? It is. That's correct. Um, I wanted to write this rookie. Um, I wanted, well, I wanted to step out of the comfort zone a little bit. Um, most guys in my position, what we wind up writing is the, uh, the, at the end of the career or at the post-career retired crusty guy uh, with all this military experience because that's who we are, right? Um, but I wanted to start with a rookie character and I wanted to connect with uh, a different generation. <clears throat> um, and I, I, I felt like she needed to be uh, female. And as I began to write Talia, one of the things I realized was writing from a 40 something experience wasn't going to work in today's environment if I'm trying to write a 20 something because we have very different experiences. We look at the world in different ways. And yeah. so um, I had to stop and do a bunch of research, talk to a bunch of people, talk to uh, a bunch of people in Talia's generation um, to readjust. Fortunately, I had presided over military operations that involved a lot of of people from Talia's generation. So I had, I had been in combat situations with these, this age group. And so I understood a little bit more about how they react. I just had to adjust my own paradigm as a writer and say, okay, I need to get out of my 20 year old head and put myself into their 20 year old head. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting, I, I hate to say, millennials, I think, get such a bad rap in so many ways that are undeserved. Um, the things that are deserved, I think every generation has, you know, done the things wrong that millennials get blamed for today. That's my opinion. But the fact is, is that um, they really are living a different life than anyone who has lived before them. And again, there's a certain amount of that's always true. You know, sure, the, absolutely. I, yeah, my, the first 20 years of my life were totally different from my mom's or my grandma's. I totally get that. But Still, this whole idea of from the moment that you're born, technology being everywhere, parents giving, you know, babies phones just to give them something to do. But then I just remember um, my little, she's not really my goddaughter, but I think of her that way. Um, my friend would hand her the phone and she had a little game on it, but it was a game for like three-year-olds, but it it was moving pictures. And so the baby was just, you know, looking at the pictures. But then I noticed like within a couple of months, she had started figuring out that if she taps on the spider, the spider is going to go down the water drain. You know, it's the itsy bitsy spider game. I, she just did things and things happened and she understood how it was happening and why it was happening. And she has a totally different look at the world and experience of the world than I do in a way that I find fascinating because it seems to me that it probably is more different than the difference between us and our parents, us and our grandparents. After your research, what do you think? Um, I think you're right. Um, obviously, like you said, everybody's experience is different from their, from their parents and, the, and in radical ways. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Calvin Miller, you know, he's his childhood and he's, he's an, uh, you know, older, just a little bit older than my parents' generation. But I mean, his childhood, the, the bathroom was outside, right? <laughs> you had to walk, walk, walk across the lawn to get to the bathroom. That was his childhood, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you have a radical change in some form or fashion with each generation. With this generation, we gave them more credit for uh, their ability to process information than past generations gave their kids. I, I think past generations were shielded from information longer 
then and all kinds of information, just not, not intentionally shielded as far as, as protecting them, but because, well, you know, here's, here's a block, right? You know, <laughs> well, instead of with these, they're given that screen where they have to figure out basically a puzzle of, oh, this is, this is cause and effect. Yeah. And so with that, they're, they have some very good um, skill sets that are higher, more, better developed than an older generation. Um, and, and so that's something that, that I, you know, obviously employ when, I, when I'm working with them and when I'm writing about them. So for listeners who are also writing um, people in their late teens and early 20s right now, do you have some pieces of advice on like who they, they should, you know, like we can all find a 20 year old to talk to, but like, how did you do your research? How did you figure out a way that you could see the differences, put it on paper so that you created a believable character who another 20 year old would read and also think is believable as well as, you know, a 40 year old reading it and going, yeah, okay, that makes sense too. What, what sorts of things would you suggest to others? Well, you know, it's a, it's a big risk, right? Because once you, when you're writing it and in, with Griffin Heist, it's been very successful. In fact, it's been so successful in connecting with that younger generation um, that I'm a little bit worried about my generation reading it and, and really connecting with it because that, you know, of how our generation sometimes views millennials. And they'd be like, wow, she's such a millennial. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, and so she has some of the same affectations that are, that are there for a reason and, and, and that uh, she can use to her advantage that, that sometimes we get frustrated with. Um, and so hopefully, you know, they'll see that, but not to the point where they'll go, ah, millennial and throw the book away. Um, right. <laughs> But you have to, I mean, it, until you write it, it's, it's a risk. And so the best thing that you can do um, is try to connect with uh, those millennials in the environment that you're writing about. In my case, it's not fair because I worked with those. I've been in combat with these people. And so it's, you know, how I, I can't say, oh, go sign up for the National Guard and, 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 and uh, you know, be like, uh, you know, Nathan Fillion in The Rookie, um, you know, and join up with a bunch of millennials when you're in your 40s. Um, I wouldn't go that far. But uh, you, you, you do what you can do, I suppose, and, and, and find people to talk to, find people to connect with and, and, and be upfront about your needs, what you're, what you're asking of them. Uh, and hopefully they'll be willing to talk to you and tell their stories. Yeah. Yeah. So for instance, if you're writing about um, a computer nerd, you probably want to talk to a, a millennial who's a computer nerd, as opposed to a millennial who's in medical school and how different that's got to be, I would think. Well, I mean, I would hope the medical school is significantly different with all the things that we um, have now as far as um, technology ways to do things as opposed to old school ways to do things. Sure. Um, so looking for, for somebody who actually is in some way involved in the field also of your character. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you're writing, focus on the positive. Um, you know, I, 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 I sure I had frustrations when, when working with millennials in hard situations and I've, you know, I was, it only happened twice, but I was the guy who made my own people cry in combat. Um, wow. <laughs> Because of pushing, pushing their boundaries, maybe. Um, but, yeah. uh, and, and, but there was always, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to focus in my writing on, on the person who couldn't hack it, but there's always, there was always somebody else with that generation who could step in and, and excel at the job yeah. um, you know, in, the, in, in the, those crunch moments. And so those yeah. are the people I tried to focus on, um, you know, when writing for that group. Well, and also I'm somebody who's been a part of so many industries and have so many life experiences, most of them fairly short, like almost everything I've done, I think has been under one year, uh, except for writing. Um, and in every single one of those situations, like I was a U.S. Marine for 85 days. <laughs> I was in, uh, you know, um, uh, the film and television business. I was in accounting and financial planning. And there's always somebody who the personality or the skill set or whatever can't hack it. So, I mean, it makes sense that there would be people. Sure. Absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. So this is so interesting. There's another question that I want to ask you, but I'm not going to specifically ask you just in case you're like, no, we can't talk about it. That will ruin the book for everyone else. Um, so let me just tell you my question and you can decide how you want to answer it. Okay. I was 
blown away because I hadn't actually thought about it ever before about where the secret is hidden in the Griffin heist. I was like, right. So without, um, I don't want to give anything away, but I want to say that then I started thinking about Jeff Bezos's space plan and Elon Musk's space plan and the things that I've heard that they say that they want to do and what will probably happen, which goes far beyond because we have no boundaries yet in space. Anyway, so hopefully I'm not saying too much, but however much you're willing to talk about, oh my gosh, where did you get this idea? And Well, I, you know, I don't think that that's a critical spoiler to, to say that we're dealing with the data vault in the amazing sphere. I think we say that in some of our advertising. Um, so where this started was when I was working on the concepts uh, with the publisher, um, it, I, I started with a uh, underwater vault. Um, and so when I, when I, when I fleshed or when I, when I, when I fleshed, when I skeleton, you know, outlined this book, I was looking at a water vault and then mission impossible came out and they had a water vault. <laughs> Dang it. And I was like, Oh, they stole my, I, how did they know I'm checking my room for cameras, um, <laughs> yeah. hidden microphones anyway. No. So I thought, okay, I can't, I can't do that. What, what, what is another hostile environment where I want my thieves to go? And it turned out better um, because the concept, one of the concepts in the book is the moral high ground. Um, Where's morality and espionage? And so then they're actually going up. And so um, the mesosphere, nobody knows about this place, but we're pretty soon, we're gonna be at the capability of putting um, uh, stationary orbit, sort of not really orbit, but high altitude, um, uh, airships that hold their position with um, uh, reaction control thrusters um, and, and just position themselves as sort of low satellites. Um, and so they can be used for communications nodes, they can be used for secure data vaults, they can be used for any number of, they can be used for weaponry, um, so they can be used for any number of things. And uh, they'll probably start below the mesosphere, because, but, but I wanted to, to push it up a notch. So the mesosphere is called, NASA calls it the ignorosphere, um, because they don't want to deal with it. They, they shoot things through it, they fall back down through it, but they don't want to stay there because it is just such a hostile environment. There's a little bit of atmosphere, um, I think one ten thousandth of what we have uh, on the surface, but... Um, and there's just enough atmosphere for there to be um, all these threats, a lot of uh, electromagnetic activity with lightning and, and, and other things that create this super, super dangerous environment. Um, so wow. I thought that was a great place to, uh, to, to, to put the data vault and, and force my characters to, to, to go to. And then once I decided to do that, I'm like, okay, how am I going to conquer this horribly, horribly uh, dangerous environment? So that was a fun challenge to attack with the book. Wow. Okay. So um, for people like me who are like, okay, I know where these layers are, but where's the ma uh, mesosphere? Can you give us the, the quick? Um, oh, man, it's been a while. I've been working on like three books since then. Oh, that's right. <laughs> but like, so, so the, the area that we live in or the, the sky above us, is atmosphere until a certain level and then is meso meso sorry can't say it mesosphere uh, well, the so next it, one no it's all it's all part of this it's all part of our atmosphere oh, um, okay but uh you have you know the stratosphere and there's all the layers up the mesosphere is on the edge of space oh okay so, okay um it's like at uh i want to say one hundred and sixty thousand feet or 150,000 feet and above, I think, depending on the source that you read, okay. uh, up to, I think, 200 and something thousand feet, but I have to go back and check. Um, but so it's, it's way up there. It's above the area where our airlines fly. Um, it's above, it's way above the, uh, <clears throat> the pressure. So up at 60,000 feet is kind of our max for pressurized aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. it, and it's not that we can't fly above that, and we soon will with the AS-2. You can read more about that in the Griffin Heist, which follows. Um, <laughs> but uh, at 60,000 feet is that point at which your blood sort of begins to boil if you lose pressure. And so that's part of the threat that I wanted to deal with. But when I began to research these airships, they're not staying at 60,000. They're going well above that. Um, and that put us in the, into very close to the mesosphere. And I'm like, well, let's put it there. Sweet. Yeah. I mean, add more danger. It's a thriller, right? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> nice. All right. So um, 
we don't want to give away too much, but I think that we've pretty much given ideas uh, about what the Griffin list is about so that people can feel like, oh yeah, that sounds good. So book two then continues to tell your story. Do you usually do your series with the same protagonist? I do, um, and, and I, 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 I always have. Um, I know that that's not always what you, what you uh, <clears throat> have to do, but <clears throat> it's what I do. Anyway, so in Griffin Heist, obviously Talia connects with this elite team of thieves. And you have, you know, grifter, hacker, daredevil, wheel man. Uh, and so all of these people are joining together with this spy. And um, in each story, they'll, they're, Talia is obviously the focus character of Griffin Heist. And then I want to connect with one character from this team of thieves in each story. So in um, uh, Chasing the White Lion, we connect with the grifter Valkyrie. And so it's really Talia and Valkyrie um, are the focus of the story and the team surrounds them in their attempt to infiltrate this. Uh, uh, it's the first ever crowdsourced crime syndicate. And so uh, it's cutthroat. Um, the, the leader is a bit sociopathic. Um, and so they need to get in there. But there's always, you know, there's always connections to, to Talia and to the past. So the, to the two books are tied together. Nice. And do you expect there to be, like, do you think that it's going to be a trilogy? Um, I would hope that, that I have a chance. Uh, and so everybody buy books. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. That's how. Um, so I hope that I get the chance to write actually one for each of the, the, the characters. So we're connected with oh, the Opry in the next one. And then I'd like to connect with Finn, the daredevil, um, and so on and so forth as we progress through the series. And so I would like there to be, you know, uh, maybe six books. Oh, nice. All right, everybody check out the Griffin Heist because the more people who like it, the more we can see all the rest of the characters. There you go. Yes. Get, get everybody's backstory and really learn, really learn the teams. That, that would nice. be the goal. Now, there was something else in your press release, which I was like, okay, I've never seen these two words in print in the same sentence. So maybe I'm reading the wrong stuff. But you have the words morality and espionage in the same sentence in your press release and say that this was something even Thomas Jefferson gave some thought to. Can you expand on this? Because this is a really interesting idea and certainly nothing that I've ever put the word. I am not, um, I am not saying anything negative when I say this. My experience in the Marine Corps did not include the word morality. That didn't seem to be high on anyone's priority list. I was there a very short time, but let me just say was my actual experience. So I've never seen or thought about the word morality in terms of anything having to do with, um, well, let me just stop talking. Morality and espionage, those are the two words. Tell us, what, where, where is this uh, thought process and everything coming from? And also Thomas Jefferson, what? <laughs> so um, when you're talking military operations, you're talking about just war theory. And um, morality in military operations or in espionage is a command level decision. And so that's where it's going to be discussed. And when you're uh, uh, getting into Air Command and Staff College, as far as an Air Force um, program, you're, you're discussing these topics. Uh, at the Air Force Academy, we start them right at, at the cadet level on wow. discussing just war theory. I mean, it's, it's, it's freshman year at the academy, you're hit with just war theory. And, and how, why are we just going into combat? Espionage is a next level up from there and discussing, you know, what, what is permissible and where do you get your authority from when you're doing cross nation um, uh, operations that may have an illegal side to them. And so that's a question that we deal with in the book. And it's a question I wanted to write about when I first started framing the story, as I've talked about before, um, I, was, I was talking about a story about morality and espionage. Um, and uh, I, I really was going to write this for the ABA market. A lot of my writing is in the ABA market. And I realized as I was writing this, that this needed to be a Christian story. Um, and uh, discussing it with uh, Lynette Eason, um, she helped me understand that too, uh, that this needed to be a faith-based story because you can't separate, when you're talking about questions of morality, um, you can't separate God from that topic because God is, is in, in my view, the author of morality. So it was an interesting discussion, and it's a discussion that we have quite a bit um, in certain 
military circles without saying saying too much is right. where does our authority come from what what makes what we're doing right versus somebody else and it has been discussed franklin ben franklin and thomas jefferson wrote letters back and forth um, discussing statementship and behavior as nations and in fact uh in the jefferson memorial there is a misquoted um fdr when he put up that memorial used uh i know i know um i, I know but one code of morality for man um he, he applies it to something completely different in the Jefferson Memorial. He cut and pasted a bunch of Jefferson's quotes together that don't quite fit in that memorial. Um, mm -hmm. That particular chunk, which is applied to a completely different quote, was actually Jefferson writing to Franklin about um, how we as Americans should comport ourselves in um, the, the espionage side of statesmanship. Interesting. Wow. Now, in your books, do you, do you cover at all the idea? I mean, so I'm about halfway through the Griffin heist, and um, Talia definitely has the um, angry young rookie thing going, at least in, in the, the amount of it that I've read so far. Um, she's obviously very smart, very tough, and you would have to be, I would think, to, to get all the way through the academy and, and become an agent. Um, so... Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Morality. Uh, so will you or have you talked through your characters in any way about the morality of um, disobeying an order? Or is it? That, you know, I think we touched on that just a little bit in um, the early portion there. Um, but no, I, I really didn't go into that side of things um, about, about the reasons to disobey an order uh, or mm -hmm. disobey a command. Um, and that's another, that's another piece of, of theory that they hit us with, uh, the Suntai incident and other um, case studies that they hit us with at the Academy early, early on. Um, yeah. But uh, Talia, I think, deals with should she disobey or should she subvert um, her boss early in the novel um, and decides to go the, uh, the more straight laced route uh, of talking to his supervisor, which does not go well for her. So yeah, um, yeah. there's really no good option when you're faced with a choice like that, as far as career is concerned. Yeah, there were some times in, in the first many chapters that I was like, okay, is Talia a, um, what's it called? Something rather narrator and unreliable, unreliable. Is she an unreliable narrator? Because I'm not sure that I see what she's so angry about or or am I going to find out things later where I'm like oh now I see why she's so angry so it was interesting I always you know you like trying to figure the all the characters out as well as the main one like why do they think the way they do and you know should should she really be trusting or not trusting and anyway that's definitely where I'm at in the reading right now so yeah Talia and interestingly enough I think I applied uh, someone I had worked with in the past because I was dealing with Talia as a foster kid a foster kid who, who lost parents at an early age and was bounced around the system in DC, which is a pretty hard system, oh, wow. um, until she, she went to Georgetown. And so that's a lot of where her anger came from. And I, I had worked with someone in the past um, who carried some of that anger. And so uh, what I realized when I was writing Talia uh, is that this needed to be not only a story about the morality and espionage side, that's kind of a, a theoretical discussion um, what this really needed to be a story about was forgiveness and healing um, because Talia needed to learn to forgive so that she herself could heal. And so that, that took on a life of its own as I began to create her character. I, I was writing this, this angry person um, who I wound up toning back from, from the reality um, because she's a very angry person and um, uh, realized, okay, this person needs healing. This person needs to learn to forgive, not just forgiveness. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. I love, I love all the layers of, of um, storytelling, whether I'm writing it or reading it, makes it more, I don't know, the deeper it is, the, the more I like it. Good deal. All right, so book one, The Griffin Heist, is currently out, right? It just came out? Correct, well, yes. You and I are talking in November. It actually didn't come out in September, right? Yeah, it came out in September, correct. Okay, great. Available everywhere books are sold? Correct, yes. So go for your, uh, go for your independent bookstores. Um, and support your independent local bookstores. And uh, uh, if you don't have access to those, go, go to the other stores. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And then book two is actually, uh, I, I know that it's on Amazon. Is it available for pre-order? If you finish book one, can you go ahead and pre-order? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, okay. good question. Tell us it about is, that. In fact. Uh, so um, the Griffin Heist, the cover is out. It's beautiful. It's on, it's on, it's available for pre-order wherever you want to pre-order books. Uh, that's book Amazon one. Or not. I'm sorry. What? Oh, sorry. Uh, Ch Chasing the White Lion. Did I say Griffin Heist? That's Chasing right. the White Lion uh, is is out for pre-order wherever you want to pre-order books. Beautiful cover. Um, we're talking about this crime crowdsourced crime syndicate um, so and cool. and how uh, it ties into Talia. But we're also talking about um, refugee kids and the vulnerabilities of kids in the refugee camps to be exploited by human traffickers um, and for labor or for for whatever. And um, that's really, I think, what, what draws Toy into the story more than people digging into the skeletons of her past and, and, and where they connect to the previous book. Um, she wants to put all that behind her. But these refugee kids um, and, and how uh, their lack of identity, oftentimes in these refugee camps, the uh, host country doesn't want to acknowledge them as citizens but the country they have fled from is certainly not going to acknowledge them. And so then when you have kids born to families or even kids that have crossed the border in these refugee camps, they have no identity. Um, there is good work being done to try to provide identities for these kids because for uh, personal self-esteem, uh, for, for your sense of what you can do in life, uh, all the way to medical treatment, um, everything comes down to, you know, you have to have an identity. And these kids have no um, as far as documentation is concerned, identity. Mm -hmm. And it also makes them very easy. When you steal someone who doesn't exist as far as governments are concerned, nobody cares. And so people like Compassion International are providing identities for these kids. And so I'm, I'm hoping that through this story, we'll have a great high you know, action adventure with this cool crowdsource. We have layer upon layer of con game that, that gets uh, Talia and Valkyrie into uh, the, the jungle syndicate, which is what this is called. But uh, underlying that, I hope people see the value of sponsoring kids um, through child advocacy programs like Compassion International. Wow. You know, you just made me um, think of something that, that I could do here where I live. So I live in Malmö, Sweden right now, which is just over the bridge from Copenhagen, Denmark. And Sweden has let a lot of refugees in. And in fact, I have a lot of friends who are um, either first generation Swedes themselves, or um, they've moved here from someplace else, some of them um, as a ref under refugee status. And I'm hearing a lot of things about that the young people are really struggling. And I won't say more because I don't know what the facts are. I've heard a lot of the things. I'm not sure what the actual facts are. But it occurs to me that I, as a writer, and any one of us um, as writers or human beings with a heart, um, there are things that we could do. And I'm just thinking, you know what? I could, I could find out whether or not the city would find a way to give me some space and uh, teach a creative writing class that would really be for, because writing does help you find your identity, whether that's point or Absolutely. not. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, <clears> that's <throat> a fantastic idea. This, this is, I, I've actually been thinking some things about like, what can I, what can I do for these kids? Like I don't speak their language and I don't know anything about their culture. And, but then I'm thinking, you know, all I need is a interpreter in a space and they just need a, a notebook or a computer and, at least they have a place to get all of their feelings out. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be a good idea. I like this. I like this. Listeners, if you're having any ideas about groups, people, adults, kids in the area that you're from, one of our other um, interviewees, oh, I can see her face. She was making me laugh. I want to say it was Patricia and I've lost her last name. Um, anyway, there is um, one of the other authors that I interviewed. She had some human trafficking stuff in her book. And then she told us that she found out there was human trafficking in her little small town in the oh, wow. South U U.S. And I was like, what? She's like, that's what I said. What? How can it be? So there's probably a lot of people that we can help in our areas. Just little things like you know, teaching a writing class, or you said that you um, ran a middle grade uh, reading club? I did. I ran a middle grade boys book club. You, you glitched on that one. I didn't hear the author's name. Was that Lynn Blackburn's book? 
Uh, oh, you know what? I, know I she, think it was Lynn. Yeah, she yeah. dealt with uh, human trafficking in her last one um, right. in the uh, 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 her diving series. So it's yeah. really, really, really good. One Final Breath, I think it was. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we homeschool our kids. And uh, Houston, where we live, is a big homeschool city. Um, you know, uh, huge co-ops, lots of opportunities. And so one of, we, we decided to provide an opportunity um, to, uh, uh, specifically for boys. Um, I think young boys literature or middle grade and teen boys literature is, is being left out. I think uh, the industry as a whole, um, both on the ABA and CBA sides of the house has uh, largely forgotten about boys. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how often I hear from a publisher, well, boys don't read. Well, just because it's not fitting the bottom line doesn't mean we shouldn't be reaching out to this age group uh, with literature. So um, one of the things my wife and I decided to do was start this middle grade boys book club. And we ran it for a couple of years. And what we would do is do a little activity. We'd read a book and then, went, and then I would pick an activity out of the book. Like we, we did My Side of the Mountain first. And, and so we took some of the survival and the traps that uh, the, the character design in the book and we put them, uh, we had the boys build them as part of the book club. Uh, and then we discussed the book and um, some amazing stories and, and impact that you know, boys in the boat and endurance, all these stories that had uh, on our boys, it was, it was great to see. But I also had this, you know, um, captive focus group <laughs> on, on what connects uh, with these boys right as I was going into writing the lost property office. And so that was, that was super effective. I should tell my husband that because um, he's been writing middle grade boys fiction. Um, all of his characters are um, boys and they're like girl characters, but no love interest. He's like, I'll never write YA because I'm not going to write that nasty love stuff. <laughs> Excuse me, which I just think is really, but um, my editor has been, encouraging him a lot saying john there's just not enough boys fiction out there you need to keep on sending it out until it gets picked up so good deal yeah 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 it's right there's not enough boys boys uh, fiction out there yeah oh man so many books so little time to write them all that's right absolutely i have an idea a day my poor wife oh. she's like no more ideas <laughs> no doubt no <laughs> doubt Oh, man. James, this has been great fun talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, people are going to want to know, where can they find you in your books? Um, you can find me on Facebook. At any, anywhere it's, it's social media, it's always James R. Hannibal. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, those are the places where I connect the most. You can message me on Facebook if you have a question, and I encourage you to do that. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and then uh, my website, uh, jamesrhannibal.com has links to all those things and all the stories. And then our fantasy website is lightraders.com. Um, but uh, for all of our books, uh, definitely go to bakerpublishing.com, which is the publisher as a, as a whole. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing all the interesting things that you know and doing so with such a, a fun personality and energy. And it's been a really fun time talking with you. Oh, it's been super fun. And, and if I could say one last bit of advice to your writer listeners is experience the adventure of the world. And that will give you uh, some stories to tell.